my name is Dennis Campbell. I'm a principal owner of Crystal Creek Enterprises here in DeWitt. And my grandfather was one of the first customers of Twin State Liquid Grow here in DeWitt in the late 60s. So we are actually third generation customers of Liquid Grow. Hi, I'm Joe Derricks and I've been with Liquid Grow on and off probably for 30 plus years. I'm Kent Bennis. I've worked with Liquid Grow for 23 years. I'm a second generation Liquid Grow user. My father uh, worked with uh, Liquid Grow before I did for a number of years. So uh, we've enjoyed working with Liquid Grow for, for many years. So Liquid Grow helps my farming operation move forward in the fact that they have good technical advisors in Dr. Jake and Dave Audi and Abe. Really, it's the people flat out. It's the people that do make move my business forward because they are the expertise that I need to be a better farmer. Very flexible in their schedule and with their outstanding people and equipment. So convenience, flexibility, and the service that they bring to our operation is critical in what we do as we try to grow corn and soybeans here. We can make one phone call and next year's fertilizer plans are taken care of. So to us, that's really important as we're trying to finish up harvest and work through a lot of the other activities in the fall. We know that when we make that call to liquid grow, it's covered and that's off of our plate. The communication between uh, all their employees uh, with their salespeople, uh, with their agronomy staff and the applicators, uh, they understand my operation and tailor uh, programs and agronomics uh, that I feel uh, are hard to find other places. If I have a problem, boom, they're there immediately. They've got somebody coming over, they've got a pump coming over, they've got products. If I have a question, they have knowledge to, to answer the questions. It's, it's a whole total package. The loadout facilities that they have here in DeWitt are outstanding and they allow us to take our trucks and pull full semi loads out and get those out to our planters and get back here in a timely fashion. So for us that's really important to keep those planters moving in the springtime and it's great to have that confidence that we know that we will be able to do that on a daily basis. We think the exchanges and returns and the service that Liquid Grow brings to our operation is really critical. We grow seed corn and so things can change on a dime. The products that we may use and the fields that we may spray, we may have a couple hours to make those decisions and get the products in hand. So the ability to come here or make that phone call and say, hey, things have changed. We've got to take this insecticide and switch it out for a different brand, or we've got to change fungicides because of hybrid issues or bug infestations, really gives us, again, that confidence to make the call to Liquid Grow and work with them on that selection of products. I use liquid fertilizer suspension for a couple different reasons. Uh, one of the main ones is I like the targeted placement. Uh, I like the banded application. Uh, so with today's uh, hybrids and varieties, uh, you know, sometimes you've got hybrids and varieties with better root systems. Uh, some maybe not as much, but they still have terrific yield potential. And by banding that fertilizer, we're allowing, you know, that plant to seek out, you know, tap into that banded fertilizer. Uh, in a more efficient way. The other piece I like is that uh, I can put in the micronutrients, particularly sulfur, uh, in a much more efficient manner. Uh, when you look at other different fertilizer systems, uh, incorporating the sulfur and the micros is very difficult. Uh, it can cause a lot of what I've seen is compatibility problems if you try and mix it with herbicides. So I'm able to do it in, in a band with liquor grow, which makes it a lot more efficient. And I feel like the placement of those and then the ability for the plant to extract it from the soil is much better that way. The reason we do is because of the consistency and basically from liquid grow, we feel like we get the most consistent uniform product from beginning to end, from the full tank to the end of the tank so that when we're spreading fertilizer, that analysis that we ordered is going on every acre from the full point to the empty point, and that's important to our operations success, period. We like that dribble band application that Liquid Grow offers because it allows the roots to follow down that concentrated band and 
find the fertility that it needs to maximize yields for us. We like the accuracy of that placement. So we know that even though the winds may be blowing out there in the fall as we're in the combines trying to finish up harvest, we can have liquid grow out there putting on that dribble band and making sure that it's gonna be the right product at the right time in the right place. We think that's really important to us. We also like the liquid suspension fertilizer for the ease of being able to add the micronutrients to it um, on a, a field by field basis or on a crop by crop basis. So the flexibility that that liquid suspension adds to our operation to make those decisions with a corn on corn field, a seed corn field, or a soybean field, field by field uh, based on the soil types and the soil test results really makes a difference to us. What I look for in a business partnership is someone that wants to have mutual benefit to both parties uh, when we're doing business. Uh, not every time does somebody win out. You know, so there, are, there is winners and losers uh, in, in these types of situations uh, and, and it can't always be one-sided and I feel like Liquor Girl always tries to you know, look at that from both sides of the table and I've always felt that you know, they always will work with me whether you know it's to their benefit or my benefit uh, we, we've always had a great business partnership uh, year in and year out uh, when it came to good times and bad times um, throughout the, the different years high service level a commitment to have the people and the equipment out there in the same relative working time frame that we are they work weekends liquid grow is wonderful for being open early in the mornings and late in the evenings when the business of agriculture happens in those busy seasons and that means a lot to us. I look for partnerships that will help me move my family farm forward, basically. So I want to I want to leave my ground in better condition than when I started. I want to leave my farm to hopefully a son or a daughter that wants to farm with me. And I need to have a successful foundation for them and Liquid Grow helps me achieve that through the expertise they have in agronomy and in their competitive prices and and really it's the whole ball of wax there. Well I'm loyal to Liquid Grow uh, because they've, they've brought value to my business every year. Uh, I know if there's ever been an issue they've helped work through the issue. First of all it's to the people. The people that I deal with in Liquid Grow are you know, they're worried about how my operation is doing. If I'm successful, they can be successful. So what I feel Liquor Grill brings to my operation that's different than, than other suppliers is, you know, it's a locally uh, family-owned business that they understand, you know, the plight of the local grower. Uh, I know who the owners are. Uh, I feel like they've got their employees, their customers, best interest in mind uh, when it comes to doing business and I feel really comfortable uh, that, that if I place money with these guys uh, I'm not going to be issues uh, down the road you know making sure that that product gets to my farm you know in a very efficient you know and, and professional manner. The convenience of having a liquid grow you know within a half an hour's drive of any farm that I have why if uh, I need something, if I run short, if uh, I have a question, boom, I can either get an answer right away or somebody's out there helping me fix something. So it's a combination of everything. First and foremost, we think it's really about the professionalism and the trust that the employees here have, and we have the confidence in their ability to, to make things happen when we need it done. So weather can get really crazy in the fall. We're still trying to finish up harvest. We may be still working on some seed corn acres and we're still starting to, to start the tillage operations and cover crops. So we know that when we can call Liquor Grow and have a quality job done very quickly, if the weather's changing on us, um, we think that that's really important to our operation. So it's about the professionalism and it's about the trust that we have in the people and the equipment that they have here. We're also pleased with the uh, relationship with Liquor Grill because it's been such a long-standing relationship for us that we've got the confidence in their financial strength and their ability to recommend products to us based on uh, what we need. Good morning. 
Welcome to the Liquor Grow Lead Academy sessions. We're happy you can join us today. We hope to see you at the rest of our sessions hosted um, throughout the month of February. You can find a full schedule on our website and we will also have it posted at the end of this talk. In addition, the Lead Academy qualifies for CCA credits. There is a link listed in the chat so that you can self-report training. And there will also be a QR code uh, on the screen during the Q&A so that you can just scan it with your phone. We hope you enjoyed this exciting presentation on biologics and everything that our research lead, Dr. Jake Bossenkemper, has learned over the past five years. At the end of the presentation, we will have Q&A with Dr. Bossenkemper, and you can submit questions at any point throughout the session through the YouTube chat. Just type a question into the chat, or you can email questions to questions at liqui-grow.com. Enjoy the presentation. Hi, I'm Dr. Jake Bossenkemper, agronomy lead at LiquiGrow. Today we're going to uh, spend some time discussing, you know, the research department here at LiquiGrow and, and why we do the production research that we do. And to help us with that conversation is Katie. Hi, I'm Katie Hess, the seed lead here at LiquiGrow, and thanks, Jake, for having me be a part of today's you're, you're presentation. You're quite welcome. You're quite welcome. Let's get this started. Um, my first question for you would be, why do we have a research department here at Liquor Grove? Yeah, Katie, that's a, that's a simple answer, really simple answer. So we have to continue to innovate, all right? Whether that's uh, uh, implementing new technologies into our business so we can help our customers be more profitable, whether that's offering a new product that can help our customers be, be more profitable. That's all, and those, those are very important things. And to understand which products are technology or practices, we have to do research. So it's really what, that simple. what has the research department been focusing on the last few years, Jake? So I, I've been focusing a lot of time on biological products, okay? That's really what I've been, uh, a lot of the research has been focused on, the, on that topic. And why, why are we so worried about biologicals, Jake? I mean, we've been watching them for the last, I don't know, probably 50 years. We just don't always see a lot of consistent results or a lot of extra bushels being added. So why biological still? Yeah, Katie, you're absolutely right. Historically speaking, um, biological products have been very inconsistent. Not, not that there isn't, uh, in some cases, a reasonable explanation for why a biological product would increase yields, but inconsistency is the key. And it's, it's been inconsistent for a long time. Is there right? any new technology on the marketplace today that's changing that game? Yeah, um, and my research in, in itself that I've done for the last four years would substantiate the fact that there's been a lot of inconsistencies and, and many of these biological type products are not increasing yields. But to your point, there has been a couple big changes in technology and some innovation triggers that are going to change the way we historically have thought about biological products. In the coming years, we're going to see some biological products likely that, that are going to add value and profit to farmers. And I'll explain a little bit more. Those, those two innovation triggers really are um, the cost to store data and, and um, the speed at which data can be processed. Okay? In addition to that, um, we've had a new genetic invention uh, called CRISPR-Cas9. Okay? So when you combine these two innovation triggers, they're going to allow us to map in detail the genetic code for any organism on the face of the planet. Okay, so if we can map and store all that data that's required to map the genetic code, and we can easily manipulate the genetic code with this CRISPR-Cas9 tool, that's going to allow us to change the function of any biological organism on the face of the planet. And that's going to have cascading effects for all aspects of biology, including agriculture. And can you tell us a little bit more, Jake, on how CRISPR-Cas9 is going to um, affect us here in agriculture today? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of key examples. All right? Sure. A couple, a couple possible examples that are being truly discussed about in the industry today. Okay. Uh, one example would be, you know, let's we, we know for a fact that there are many bacteria in the soil today that fix very small amounts of atmospheric nitrogen. And when I say that, there's bacteria that can take nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere and turn it into plant available nitrogen in the soil right now in all of our fields. But the truth is, they really, you know, today those bacteria are only fixing probably 
a half a pound and maybe five pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. Basically amounts to nothing. And that's why we're not seeing a huge bang for our buck on some of this biologicals we're applying to the soil today. Yeah, that, that, that's part of the reason why. And so how is the CRISPR going to change this? Yeah. For so the future? is what is what we, we know that we can do is that we can change the net genetic code of some of these bacteria to upregulate that nitrogen fixation process. So instead of fixing a half a pound per nitrogen per year, maybe by, by manipulating that code, we could fix 25, 30, 40 pounds of nitrogen per year. I mean, that's, that's possible. And Jake, we all know as our landscape changes, the consumer is really driving what we're doing. And the consumer's probably really gonna like knowing that, yeah. that we're gonna be able to fix more nitrogen ourselves. Yeah, that's right. And so the other benefit about you know, having a bacteria fix, fix atmospheric nitrogen, it's a slow release form of nitrogen fertilizer, right? It's different than commercial fertilizer. They both have their advantages and disadvantages, but yeah, the, you know, the, the idea is that you know, some of these bacteria that fix nitrogen for corn, um, it's gonna be a lot more slow release and environmentally sustainable. So the technology is getting more economical to work with, and we've got this new technology, CRISPR-Cas9. Mm -hmm. um, so how fast is this gonna to come to the marketplace when you put all of that together? Yeah, um, so, so I've been focusing on biological research a lot for the last four years. And, and as of last year, I have field tested one, uh, one biological product that had, that had its genetic code modified with CRISPR-Cas9, okay? But this coming year, in 2021, I'm working with four different companies that either have genetically modified organisms or they've used these genetic tools to select and identify these organisms. Um, so it's coming. Um, a lot of these products that we're talking about that are going to be manipulated by CRISPR-Cas9 or, or these tools are going to be used on are either pre-commercial or are just hitting the market. Well, that's great that you're right there at the forefront yeah. working with some of these mm -hmm. companies. Can you tell us more about that? What companies are you working with? You know, yeah. what are you finding so far in last year's research? Yeah, so uh, the companies that I'm going to be working with have to some extent, but are going to be working a lot more with are, are, are Indigo. You probably may, you may, you may have heard of, the, heard of them, uh, Pivot Bio, um, New Leaf Symbiotics, and Sound Ag. So those are companies that I'm going to be doing a lot more research with in the future and um, are making some big waves because they're using this new technology. So Jake, um, I'm sure that this is really exciting technology and there's a lot of other look-alike Me Too products out there too. So can you explain to the group how you've been able to kind of weed through some of that today? Yeah, so as Katie kind of mentioned, uh, there's a lot. Part of the problem with all this is that, you know, we're going to have some very legitimate players in the market that are going to be using some of this advanced technology to develop new biological products that may in fact offer some, some serious, you know, yield increases to farmers and profit increases, but we also are going to have some companies that are going to jump on the train. They're going to jump on the bandwagon, okay? And I feel that it's part of my responsibility, um, you know, as a leader at our company to help our, our company and our customers understand which of these products are truly beneficial and which ones aren't, okay? And, and you do that all winter yeah, long. And I, and I do that all winter long, and I've been doing it for the last four years, and to be honest with you, not many at all have risen to the top of a place where I feel like we can sell them to this point. Um, there is a company that, that uh, is called um, uh, Terramax Biologicals, and, and there's a couple products out of many that I've tested that do look like you know they're adding some value. It's not a game changer at this point, it's not a silver bullet, um, but, but they are adding a little bit of yield to both corn and soybean. Jay, can you tell us a little bit more about those products that you're, you have found some yeah, positive uh, benefits to? Yeah, again, you know, these aren't game changers, but, but uh, there's a product called uh, MicroAZ. It's a corn product, so uh, you apply this product in furrow. Um, it is a bacteria, okay, and this bacteria is called Azosprilia umbrella sensei. Uh, this bacteria really does two things. It, uh, it produces a plant growth regulator that basically stimulates fine root hair development. Okay, so, so this bacteria naturally produces this, this, this growth hormone and it helps stimulate root, root growth and development. And by the way, in the future, we may be able to manipulate a bacteria like this to produce even more of that plant growth regulator, which could stimulate root growth even more, right? So that's the things we can look forward to. But this one has not been genetically modified. 
So we get more root hairs, we get more root hairs, we get greater water uptake, we get greater nutrient uptake, and the possibility for higher yields. So if a guy doesn't have in capabilities, is there anything that he could do seed treatment wise with this product? This product is not available as a seed treatment for corn, um, but you can apply it in furrow or, or basically two by two or close to the furrow. That's, that's where it should be placed. The other thing that this product does is it also fixes atmospheric nitrogen, okay? It's, it's somewhere in the order of five to 20 pounds per acre per year, a little bit better than the normal bacteria that live in the soil. It, but it is something, right? So nitrogen fixation, uh, root hair development, greater water nutrient uptake. Um, with this product, I've looked at it at 10 locations, and on average, I've seen a 3.9 bushel yield increase. So it's something. Um, you know, it's not the 7, 8, 9, 10 bushel we might see in a few years, uh, but it is something. Um, and I think if we were to position this product specifically in environments where uh, there's more water stress, or more stress in general, I think you're gonna see you know, more consistent and larger yield increases. That's my observations from these 10, 10 field sites where I've tested it so far. Great, Jake. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with the group today on some of these biologicals you're currently working with? Yeah, there's a, there's a soybean product that's actually, uh, it's actually the same bacteria, okay? It's, 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 uh, the product is called Nutec SI. Again, it's made by Teramax Biologicals. Um, it's Azosprilia umbrella sensei plus Brady rhizobium, okay, the normal infixing bacteria for soybean. This one's a little more complicated. Um, not only does it cause uh, root hairs to, more root hairs per, per, per plant in soybean, but it also helps signal uh, Brady rhizobium to, to produce uh, nodulate harder, more nodules, and, and nodules that are, that are uh, more capable of fixing a greater amount of nitrogen for the soybean crop. And <laughs> it gets deep, but if you really look into this and you, you look at some of my past talks that I've given, soybeans are often uh, nitrogen limited, Katie. Um, we don't think of that because they fix their own nitrogen, but the truth is, in a lot of cases, they only fix about 40 to 60% of the nitrogen they need. So the rest has got to come from the soil or from some other source. And this, this Azosprilia umbrella sensei bacteria I'm talking about, remember I said it can fix 5 to 20 pounds per acre per year. That could be another source that's going to help it out. Okay, so what I found so far, you know, with this bacteria is, is uh, I've tried broadcast applying it with pre-emergent herbicides. I've seen it increase yields like that. It's not super consistent. Um, I, the, the most consistent placement I've seen or application method I've seen is with our liquid suspension fertilizers in the spring for sure, maybe even in the fall, but I'm, I'm most confident they're going to be applied in the spring. I've seen about a 2.4 bushel yield increase by applying it in the spring with our fertilizers. I've also seen it work as a seed treatment. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, there could be some issues with antagonism regarding the seed treatment active ingredients. Right. So I'm still still working through that, deciding if that's going to be a commercially Although, viable. Although, is there a new formulation coming with this that might work a little better with the seed treatment? Yeah, that's a great question. So next year, I'm going to be testing a, a extender, basically an extender that you could that you can apply with the active ingredients and the bacteria itself that potentially can help extend the shelf life of the bacterial inoculants. And when you're talking so, shelf life, Jake, you're saying, you know, production research, you could probably apply this and then put it in the ground two or three days. But us in the production world, yeah. we probably need to have it on there a couple weeks in advance. And that's your difference several for weeks. shelf yeah, life. Yeah, not, we're not talking a half a year or no, a year, we're no, talking weeks. No. So, and is the issue with the seed treatment is killing your bacteria or how, what's the issue so far today? Yeah, those are both great questions. So you're absolutely right. So, so the research that I've done with this bacterial inoculant is, you know, I've treated these soybeans, you know, five to six days before I go plant them, right? right. And I go plant them, right? But in the real world, you know, we're treating soybeans at the end of March and they may sit there and they may get planted at the end of April, they may get planted in the middle, middle of May, they may not get planted until the beginning of June. Although, watch our high <laughs> yield soybeans and we'll know yeah. we wanna get that April time yeah, frame. Yeah, we, we wanna try to hit the <laughs> April time frame, that's right. But the reality is they may not get planted till the middle, till the beginning of June. So, so can the bacteria survive on the seed with these other active ingredients that can cause mortality of the bacteria 
for up to a month? That, that's the question we're trying to answer. And we think maybe that these extender products could help extend the viability up to that month. Okay, so I've definitely seen yield increases when I can plant within four or five days. But the next step is, can we, you know, can we let this bacteria sit on, sit on treated seed for up to a month? And we're gonna look at that in this coming growing season. So I hope you're finding out. So the next piece <laughs> is making it production available. Yeah, exactly. I, I, hope, I hope you're finding out there's a lot to this. There's a lot to I'm glad all we this have research to do and all development. The research. That's definitely. And, and making sure that, that these products are, are something that are actually gonna help our customers, right? There's a lot to it. So there's to wrap to this it. up with the biological change, um, biological industry changing and it's gonna change fast, how do you see where this CRISPR-Cas9 is going to be able to help these um, products we're talking about today? I believe that, you know, if, if, if we're, I believe that if I'm seeing a 3.9 bushel yield increase with the best biological product today that I've looked at today, right? I believe there's gonna be a step change in the future where in the next five years, we might be talking about products that are gonna, biological products that are gonna increase yields on the order of seven to 10 bushels per acre consistently. So that's gonna be a change. It's gonna take some time, it's gonna take uh, you know, people like myself and our company, uh, you know, going through the legitimate players in the market and the legitimate products and the non-legitimate players in the market and the non-legitimate products, and that's my job, and I take that seriously. Um, but, but we want to help our customers with those things because I think it will be, I think biological products will be important in the very near future, and it's here today. We're just to the point now where we're really kind of sorting out, hashing out the the ones that are going to help us and the ones that aren't going to help us. So. Well, thank you so much for all of your information today, Jake. I know folks out there probably really appreciate hearing some updates from you on the research department. I know this summer and the spring, Jake's going to be having the videos out in the field again at the yep. research farms. And so we'll probably have some updates on this, I would hope. Yeah, you bet. You bet. And I, I thank everyone for their business and their time today. So thank you. Excellent, excellent presentation by Dr. Bossen Kemper. Thank you very much. Uh, we're lucky to have him here today to answer questions. I have had quite a few questions come through during the presentation. So as a reminder though, if you have a question and you haven't submitted it yet, you can post it in the chat, um, in the YouTube chat feature, or you can email questions at liqua-grow.com. So, okay, first question for you, um, Dr. Boston Kemper. The bacteria are fixing atmospheric nitrogen. Is there a chance we would run out of nitrogen in the atmosphere? Highly unlikely uh, because the atmosphere, I believe if I remember correctly, is about 72 or 78% nitrogen gas. So luckily for us, there's lots of nitrogen in the atmosphere. It just isn't plant available. And, you know, one of the avenues that, have, that has been uh, discussed in a lot of detail uh, in the industry as well as in academia is getting these, these uh, bacteria that fix nitrogen to do a better job of it. And we think we can upregulate some pathways to increase the amount of N that they can actually take out of the, the atmosphere and, and put into the soil as a plant available form. Okay. Um, next question coming through on the chat. Can these biologics be combined into starter fertilizer? Uh, it depends. And that's why you need to partner with a group like us to help you answer those questions, because it depends. Um, and that's the first question. If I were a farmer, I'd ask my ag retailer or whoever selling you the biological product is, what is it compatible with? Because in many cases, I believe that... Um, these products are being mixed with uh, either fungicides or, or insecticides or herbicides or fertilizers that they're not compatible with. And when I say, when I say compatibility, I mean, uh, you know, the, the fertilizer or, or herbicide would mortally injure and kill the bacteria that you want to survive. So I know for a fact, the product I talked about, MicroAZ, is compatible with the starter fertilizers that we sell because I've done the compatibility testing. Um, so, so it depends. Straight answer. Okay. 
Um, next question coming through. Can the biological product for beans be applied with water in furrow with the planter? Yes, the biological product, New Tech SI reference, can be applied in furrow with water uh, with the planter. I would avoid using chlorinated water if possible. Um, I would apply at least three gallons per acre because you need at least three gallons per acre in a 30 inch row to get a continuous stream down the row. Mm -hmm. um, I'd probably bump it up to five gallons if you can stomach that. I know that means stopping and filling more, but I think you're gonna get better coverage down the row if you went to five gallons versus three gallons in 30 inch rows. 15 inch rows, three gallons should be fine. Okay, uh, another question from the chat. I'm curious how long products with growth hormones remain stable or active in 624.6. Is it better to add the day of use? Yes, it's always better to add the day of use. I mean, when in doubt, do that. Um, okay. What I can tell you for sure is we did a 48, it was a 48 hour compatibility test. And after 48 hours, we had greater than 80% survivability. So 80% okay. or greater survivability after 48 hours. Um, so, you know, that tells me that, you know, put it in the tank the day you're planting it but I probably wouldn't let it sit in there if they're, if, you know, if, if they're calling for rain. Um, maybe it lives longer than 48 hours. We, we, we don't know, but we know that it lives for 48 hours. Oh, that makes sense. Um, do you foresee these biologic nitrogen fixation products overtaking traditional nitrogen fertilizer at some point? Not in the foreseeable future. Okay. And I say that because I, I guess the, the, the answer to the question is I see, you know, number one, you know, I talked about nitrogen fixing bacteria for corn. You know, those are products I'm testing. It's, it's a little bit hypothetical still, right? I, I can't guarantee that that's actually going to happen in a, in a huge way, right? Right. Um, you know, the product we're selling, yes, it does provide some, the micro AZ, it does provide some small amount of nitrogen for corn but it's not, it's not a ton, right? It's nowhere close to meeting the requirements of the crop. I think the big challenge that uh, we're gonna have to overcome is uh, these, you know, corn takes up as much as three pounds of N per acre per day from V5 to, to VT. There's a massive amount of nitrogen that's gotta be taken up in a short period of time. And we're a long, long, long way from bacteria being able to supply that much nitrogen that rapidly. So there's going to have to be a significant concentration of N in the rooting, rooting zone between that V5 and VT to meet the crop demands. So I do not see in the foreseeable future uh, bacteria being able to do it on their own whatsoever. I think they'll be able to provide a slow release form that, that can meet the requirements after tasseling uh, or, or pre-V5. But uh, at, between that V5 and, and VT R1 or so stage, no way. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, question coming through the email. Any synergy with fertilizer, which we've discussed a little bit, other biologics or other bios or sugar molasses? Um, yeah, uh, there, there are potential synergies between these products. In fact, uh, I've seen that actually in some of my studies, but I think it's, I think it's somewhat rare. I mean, I, I actually don't think it's a great idea to mix two or three biologicals together in your inferno starter system, for example, because they could be antagonistic too. Uh, they, could, they could compete with one another. So I think, it's, I think you're better off to uh, uh, stick with a product, you know, they're, they're stick with one product from, from a, a source that you can trust and you know that it's field tested locally. The other question was, should I add sugar with it? It, it? it makes sense that, you know, sugar is a simple carbon source that, that bacteria could, could pretty easily use. Um, there's not a lot of evidence though, uh, scientific evidence uh, amongst academics and, and others that, that it helps. Okay. I know that, you know, Bex has a bunch of work that shows that it does help, uh, but uh, I've actually done some trials where we've put added sugar and it didn't help any. So 
I don't think that that it's an approach that's going to make a huge difference. Um, I, I think you should just focus on a biological product that you know is proven in your local environment. Mm-hmm. Which are few and far between, by the way. But um. <laughs> okay, um, let's go back and see. I have another question here. Well kind of address this, but are there any specific environments or fields where you would place the two biological products that you talked about? Like what are, what are the specific areas, fields, et cetera? Yep. Where you place them? Absolutely. Let's talk about that. Mm-hmm. So with the, let, let's, let's review the modes of action of the micro AZ infra corn product. The modes of action of the micro AZ infra corn product are a small amount of nitrogen fixation, five to 10 to 15 pounds per acre per year. So it's not a lot, it's something though. And most importantly, it's root hair proliferation and increased number of root hairs. So if we think about what that bacteria is doing to corn, it is providing more rooting area, which is gonna allow it to take up mineral nutrients and water under stress. So in other words, if you have plenty of mineral nutrients and plenty of water, you know, it probably isn't gonna do that much. But if you have an environment where we run out of water um, or an environment that tends to be tough and or grouthy all the time, I really think that's where that product's gonna shine more than in a great 260 bushel yield environment, you know, corn yield environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that goes along with my observations. I mean, I've seen yield increases in high yielding environments, but those high yielding environments were associated with a very dry uh, kernel filling period. So I think, you know, the, 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 the positioning should be the tougher the growing conditions, the, the, the larger the yield increase you could expect and more consistent yield increase you could expect from micro AZ. So position it in tougher farms, or if you, if you want to, you know, have a little bit of insurance that if it does get dry at the end of the season, uh, you know, with, uh, in, in some very highly productive uh, ground, I do think it is an insurance policy in that situation because I've seen it do that. Okay. Um, the the New Tech SI soybean product, little different positioning there. There was actually a meta analysis review paper published out of Brazil here uh, a month ago. I've read read it several times, and the observations that they've made are not all that different than the few or the small amount of observations I have here in, in the upper Midwest relative to what they have anyway. But is what they really called out is they really called out that the big time yield increases are coming in no tillage in South America when you have wetter soils and when the soil texture has more sand. Not to say that in silt loam soils or clay soils, they did not have yield increases in South America but the yield increases were just larger in the sandy soils. So sandy no-till soils here in the U.S., it appears to me to be a, a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in early planting no-till situations and wet cold soils, um, I think that's another place that it's gonna shine here in North America. And by the way, in my trials, that's where I've seen it really increase yields is in wet, cold, no-till situations. Um, I'm really starting to see a trend there in my own data. You know, I don't have enough locations to be like, yep, that's it. That's where it belongs. Mm -hmm. But that's the way the trend is headed. Cold, no-till situations, which would often align with early planting. And we know that early planting is is a factor to increase soybean yield. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's that's what I've seen. Okay. So if they want to get started sooner, this would be a good way to support that particularly in no-till. That's what it seems mm-hmm. like. Okay. I have another question coming in through the YouTube chat. Are there any products you see harming the performance of these biologicals such as NH3? Yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, NH3 has an extremely high pH. It's, it's likely to uh, mortal, uh, mortally injure uh, many soil organisms, fungi, bacteria. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if the NH3 comes in, if, if the high ammonia concentration from that band comes in contact with this bacteria or any other bacteria, it will mortally injure um, the bacteria. However, you know, I don't necessarily think that, that you're gonna be placing this bacteria with a high concentration of NH3. 
like if you're putting it on with the planter, for example, the NH3 should be six, seven, maybe eight inches deep. Um, by the time you're planting your corn, that, that, that hot zone should be diffused enough in the soil. I don't think it's going to cause a lot of direct mortality with the bacteria, but, but hypothetically, yeah. Okay. Let's see, I have another question here over the email. Um, okay. Did you say you could apply the new tech SI with liquid suspension fertilizers in the fall or spring, either or? Yeah, so I think I said uh, I've applied it in the fall and spring, but I have a lot more experience in the spring, meaning I'm more okay. confident that it works when applied in the spring. But I will tell you, um, I have applied it in the fall okay. uh, and I have seen yield increases and real yield increases and, and yield increases in the order of uh, two to two and a half bushels per acre. Okay. Um, so it can work in the fall, but you know, Lisa, this is, this is one of those things where I'm just going to be as transparent as possible. This is a moving target. I'm, I'm still hashing out what is the best placement and positioning mm -hmm. for, for this product and the micro AZ. And I hope our customers can see that this is a real effort to not only recommend a product, but help them understand where you need to use it and where you don't um, and how do you best use it. So you know, we're going to a place where a lot of these companies have not. We are going to local trials uh, where we look at different application methods and positioning. Um, you know, so I'm still working on the answer to the question. You know, is it better, better, better to apply it in the fall or the spring? Um, or is it just as good in the fall versus the spring? I have trials designed right now in the field to help us answer those questions. So stay tuned. Uh, but uh, I have seen it work in the fall uh, and as well as the spring to answer the question uh, straight up. Okay. So are we seeing a lot of adoption of this strategy or interest? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I get phone calls from our sales team all, all the time about it. So okay. I do think there's interest and adoption. Um, okay. Yeah. Continue to stay tuned. Um, you know, I'm always looking for better products. <laughs> and products that are more consistent than the ones I have. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, stay tuned. We'll continue to look and, and do our best to identify practices and products to help our customers. Okay, I have another question coming through the email. Why do many of these biological products not work in your studies? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a hundred million dollar question. Um, I, it, 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 it's likely a result of several things. I think number one, um, we have really good soils where we, where we right. luckily we have really good soils where we farm. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I'm testing these products in high organic matter soils that generally have good water supply, generally are, are well-drained, um, generally have, uh, you know, they're, they're well oxygenated. Mm -hmm. um, they have good soil tilth. So I think they're the perfect place to grow corn and soybean. And right. if we don't need any extra help, um, you know, a, a biological product's not going to help us. Mm -hmm. I think that's one reason why we, you know, I don't see as consistent results as maybe some of these companies do or some other folks do. I think that's a big part of it. I also think that, uh, you know, there's <laughs> typically, typically, Lisa, when I see marketing data, I tell farmers, uh, just go ahead and assume that it's you're going to get about half the yield increase that the marketing pamphlet says. <laughs> that's that's just been a, my right. experience. So I think the marketers get their hands on this stuff, and sometimes yeah. they like to inflate some of the findings. Um, I think that there's a lot of compatibility issues that I brought up, and I think that when I add these products to our fertilizers, um, uh, I think a lot of times there's immediate death. Um, I don't think there's been a lot of compatibility testing done. And finally, you know, I, I think the results are so variable because you're, you're putting these bacteria into the soil and they have to compete with the native bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, Azosprilli umbrella sensei, the, the product that's both in NewTek SI and micro AZ, it's been found to be a pretty good competitor in, in an open soil system. And I think that's one of the reasons why it is more consistent than a lot of these other products. Um, so, you know, you're asking these bacteria to not only help the crop plants, but also to defend themselves and fight for food uh, in a system where it literally is a fight uh, for survival between all these organisms. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. I have another question. Can we add biologicals to corn starter 
And what should we be looking for in a biological to add to corn starter to increase yields? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I, that's the question that I've been asking for about four years. I've looked at okay. humic acids, I've looked at fulvic acids, I've looked at bacteria, I've looked at fungi, I've looked at combinations of bacteria and fungi and humic acids. Um, I've looked at uh, uh, nutrient chelators. I mean, you name it, Lisa, I've looked at it. Okay. And uh, that micro AZ, Azosprilli Umbrella Sensei product is the product that I am most confident in after, after four years of studying these materials. Okay. Again, like I said, it's not a silver bullet. And I think mm -hmm. that if you want it to really provide ROI, you're going to have to position it in, in environments where you expect stress. But it's the best product that I've found. Um, not to say that there aren't some other products that are right on its heels um, and that, you know, you know, Lisa, there, there's other products that, that I think are better. Um, and, and it's right on that micro AZ product's heels but I don't have a lot of experience with it, you know, okay. with them. I've got one year of data and I'm not about to tell our salespeople, or our customers mm -hmm. to go try a product based on one year of information. So I continue to look for, for new and better materials, but I'm not there yet. So micro AZ, Azosprillium, Brella Sensei, applied in furrow for now. Okay, good. Let's see, my next question is, are biologics going to replace key nutrients in our management programs? No, not completely. Um, it it kind of goes back to that question about are, are these nitrogen fixing bacteria right. gonna replace the, the, the nutrient needs for, right. you know, nitrogen needs for corn. It's a different question though. They said key nutrients, um, not completely. Will they supplement potentially? Could you apply less commercial fertilizer, P and K, because you're using a biological product that, uh, that, that solubilizes uh, insoluble P in the soil, for example? Yeah, maybe. And I tell you what, um, along with all these ecosystem services markets that, that we talked about there um, in the first lead meeting, Lisa, the carbon credit market, you know, there's, there's other things that are coming down the pipe with these ecosystem services market mm -hmm. markets. Like, you know, if you reduce your fertilizer usage by 25%, you will get a payment for doing so. And it says fertilizer usage. Well, if you have to reduce your fertilizer usage, um, could you use a biological product to help right. um, supplement, you know, the, the commercial mm -hmm. fertilizer you cannot use now. I was talking to an agronomist out in Maryland yesterday afternoon. Uh, they can not apply, uh, they, they have a limit to the amount of fertilizer they can apply mandated by the state of Maryland. Okay. Um, so in those cases, you know, yeah, I think it could help supplement commercial fertilizer, but is it going to replace commercial fertilizer? Not in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the key is to just know about the product and options, work with your partner, and then figure out how it fits into the operation, not replace anything or eliminate a certain practice, but where does this, where does this play a role? Yep. And I think we have a lot to learn about what you just mentioned, uh, but, but it's going to be, it's going to start happening pretty quickly, I think, mm -hmm. because uh, mm -hmm. like I mentioned in my presentation, there's a, I've really started to key in on the legitimate players in this marketplace. And I think we're going to start seeing some bigger things. I could be wrong. Could be wrong, Lisa, but uh that's what my gut's telling me. Okay, good. I have another question coming in through the email. Are biologics working more in corn or soybeans? The, the truth is, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I can answer that question with any, okay. uh, you know, good background information of, that I would have, but I would say that you're going to see more products that are going to le be legitimately increasing corn yields because there's just more focus on corn. There always has been. Corn is still king. Uh, the target is is the tar corn is being also being targeted because there is environmental uh, you know contamination issues around nitrogen fertilizer usage. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think we're going to have a larger impact on growing corn with biological products before we do in so with soybean in general. Okay. I have a question from the chat. How many years of getting positive results in testing before these products are available for purchase from liquid growth? Well, it took me three years to 
decide, uh, it took me three years to decide we were going to offer the micro AZ product for corn. And mm-hmm. it took me two to decide we were going to offer the, the, the new tech SI product for soybean. So mm-hmm. at minimum two, um, and it, you know, at minimum two, uh, not only two locations, not only two years, but, but I had multiple locations, mm-hmm. Lisa, over each of those years. Um, yeah, at minimum two at, at multiple sites. Right. And then our recommendations on how to, or when to, or where to will be ongoing, right? As we will be ongoing. Yes, research that's right. And, right. Yep. Okay. Lisa, the other thing I'll add is, you know, yes, please. I am I am helping farmers whittle down the pack here of these products. Mm-hmm. Uh, by no means is there a promise or a guarantee that these products are going to work on every acre and every year mm-hmm. and every soil type. Is what I'm really telling you and our salespeople are, I've seen something with this product with my AZ, for example. If I were you, I'd take a look at it. If I were you, I'd do your own on-farm investigations and decide whether or not this is something you want to use. I'm, I'll, I'll say the same with the, with the soybean product. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't predict everything, but it, it definitely is something that I've seen to increase both corn and soybean yields. And it's something that I would give a try. Mm-hmm. But that's every product on the market. That's every input, right? I mean, yeah. there's no, there's no, not, not necessarily, not necessarily okay. because, you know, these, I'll use a fungicide, for example, you know, we know a fungicide in corn, if it was developed by Bayer or BASF or okay. Sagina, we know that that fungicide should control fungi because it's backed by a very large company that has a lot of experience doing mm-hmm. this and it should control fungi. There might be one that controls fungi better, but we know that, that these products will control fungi. And the same with go for wheat, we, you know, uh, go for uh, herbicides, for example. You know, we know that 2,4-D, uh, we know that, that these extend, uh, we know that products that are labeled to control water hemp should control water hemp in general, mm-hmm. right? But these bacterial inoculum products, that's not necessarily the case. Okay. Uh, you know, we, they're not, they're just not going to be as consistent or reliable as some of these products that have been around for, 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 for decades. Okay, good. Let me check, um, with our questions. Okay. It looks like I have all the questions so far addressed in the chat and in the email. If you, one question for you is, okay, so if we, if I'm a grower sitting here today, you know, what's the next step? What should I, what should I do right now getting ready for planting season? If I'm watching this and I have interest or I have questions, I mean, and I'm thinking about when I'm going to start, how I'm going to set up for this spring, what's the next step for them? Well, when it comes to, I guess, the biological conversation, the next step would be, I would contact your liquor grow sales rep. Okay. Uh, they, they've sat in on lots of meetings and actually should know quite a bit more detail than what I've given even in the, the presentation about my okay. experiences with micro AZ and new tech SI. Um, and if the salesman, you know, wants to bring me into the conversation, I'm happy to, to get involved in the conversation, mm-hmm. but you know, we didn't talk about pricing or rates. Um, mm-hmm. those are all questions that a farmer would need to get hashed out before he buys this product or any product. So I would, I would ask your local liquor rep um, about pricing rates and mm-hmm. uh, any other questions they may have about these products. Um, the, other, the other thing I would be thinking about if I was a farmer is let's start putting a plan together. You know, every weather and unforeseen breakdowns can always uh, thwart good plans, but it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's important to have a plan. Uh, it, you know, I plan when I plan my research trials, I have a plan. It may not always work out like I wanted it to, but I have a plan. And I think a good solid production plan is important. And timing is half the battle in getting good yields. Um, mm-hmm. So I think put a plan together. Uh, and I think that if you don't feel like you're organized enough or you have a good plan, that's something that we're pretty good at is putting crop production plans together. So again, reach out to your local liquor grow advisor to, to help you get a plan put together. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, excellent material. Very interesting topic. I know you've put a lot of time and effort into this. Um, we've answered all the questions. So with that, I just want to thank everybody who joined us today for logging on to this session. If 
If for some reason you think of a question after the fact that you didn't ask, you can always email us at questions at liqua-grow.com. That's um, an open email all the time. You can also talk to your local sales rep or local location, liquor grow location. We hope to see you at the rest of our lead sessions. We have, I believe, three left. Our next session is actually going to be tomorrow, February 19th, again at 9 a.m. And it's a great presentation on how to maximize profitable soybean yields. So again, thanks for tuning in and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow.